Good evening this evening. I'm going to backtrack a little because there's some things that fit so nicely together. And uh, we'll talk about things from the 8th through the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. And the reason I want to encompass a little bit more and go back to something we discussed earlier, because these things need to be put together to see the whole picture of what Christ is revealing. Remember, uh, we talked about when Christ fed the multitude in the wilderness and had all of the crumbs picked up afterward so that none were remaining on the ground. And this, of course, was as if to say, I'm the God who gave the manna to the Hebrews in the wilderness. And as I commanded them, all of the manna was to be picked up and to be consumed right then, except for the Sabbath. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't pick up the manna, but God would allow the manna to remain over the Sabbath. And when Christ feeds the multitude in the wilderness miraculously, and again has all of the crumbs picked up, you wonder why would he have all of the particles of crumbs picked up? Except that this is part of the revelation about who he is, that he is, as Moses, you know, very often they refer to Christ as, are you the prophet or are you that prophet? They're talking about the one that Moses said would come after and would be greater than him. And even when John the Baptist says, one greater than me comes after me, the straps of whose sandals are not worthy to un unloose, he's sort of repeating the prophecy of Moses as well, that a great prophet would come after him who was greater than him. Now, this incident where Christ heals the blind man who's outside the temple is also extremely significant, and I want to put these prophecies together, or these revelations that were together. Because when Christ is standing in the temple, and the lawyers and scribes and Pharisees are pressing him, uh, and he says that Abraham longed to see my day. And in the course of the conversation, they said, what, uh, are you older than our father Abraham? You're, you're not even 60, because 60 was a very old age. So they, uh, you're, you're not even that old yet, and yet you claim to see Abraham. And he says, truly, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And they do exactly what he was saying. I am that I am. Ego, ego, all, I'm the one who spoke to Moses on the Mount of Sinai and through the burning bush, and said, he said, remember Moses said, who shall I tell him to sent me? And he said, tell him I am has sent you. And uh, here again, he, he reveals quite directly, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones, they were going to stone him to death or attack him in any case. So he held their eyes so they couldn't see him. And this, I surmise, is a reference to Isaiah 9, 6, the, 9, 6 through 12, where he says the thing that uh, he closed their eyes so that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not hear. And when we, when we realize what's said by Isaiah, seeing they might not see, is God intentionally preventing people from seeing who he is and hearing who he is? No, God forbid, but if the fact is, their spiritual eyes were closed. They could see with their physical eyes, so they might as well not see with their physical eyes because they couldn't see with their spiritual eyes. Then when Christ goes out of the temple, comes down by the step, and there's the man who was born blind. And remember Christ approaches him. He doesn't approach Christ to ask for something. And Christ asks, would you like to have your sight? Would you like to see? And, of course, Christ makes, takes the dust of the earth that is spittle and makes clay and puts it on the eyes uh, and says, go and be baptized in the pool of Siloam, baptize yourself, really, in the pool of Siloam, and then you'll have your sight. And, of course, here again, Christ is revealing that he, the one who created his eyes from the beginning, from the dust of, of the earth, and sends him to be baptized in the water. Man is made of water and, and dust. And uh, then he receives completely his sight. 
And this is extremely important also because those who had the scripture and knew the scripture nevertheless could not see spiritually. They could see only physically. So they could read the scripture, perhaps memorize every chapter and verse, but they still couldn't see what was actually there. And when they did perceive who Christ was, when he revealed who he was, they were sent into a fury because of the spiritual blindness. And here a man who was physically blind and asked nothing is healed by Christ. His spiritual eyes could be open. It's not to say that his spiritual eyes were open before this, but that Christ knew him and knew that his spiritual eyes would be open when he received his physical sight. So to give him his physical sight, knowing that he would also, the eyes of his soul would be open, the eyes of his spirit would be open. And so the whole revelation here about Christ and who he is. And also the thing about baptism and people often, you know, there's a lot of, uh, within the whole expanse of what's called Christianity, there are all kinds of debates about what baptism means. And first of all, it's partly because people don't like mystery. They want some concrete scientific explanation of everything. And yet, here is a mystery that we can't enter the heavenly kingdom unless we're born from above of water and the spirit. And why water and the spirit? Because that's what man was born from in the very beginning. That's why the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and life came out of the water. And man was composed of, well, water, soil, minerals, and the inbreathing of the Spirit of God. So that to be born again is to have the eyes of the Spirit opened so that we can actually see. If we understand it as the mystery that it is, instead of closing people's eyes by telling them it's only a symbol that uh, you, you believe that you have to have full faith before you're baptized, of course you can't, because baptism opens your spiritual eyes, and you can see more profoundly, more deeply. And people take baptism as a, a symbol of having been converted. But conversion in the beginning is a desire to know and to understand. Baptism opens our spiritual eyes so that we can. And the thing in baptism actually makes us a part of the body of Christ. We're born again into the body of Christ, whether we're infants or whether we're adults. And uh, very often the debates about these matters, I'm sort of saying Christ said to be born again of water and the Spirit. He didn't give us any other source of being born again. Not emotional experiences, not revelations, not angels appearing with trumpets or anything else. Water and the Spirit. And it's so important for us to grasp that if we're being born again, we're being born in the same, in a repeat of how we were created in the first place. From water and, and, and uh, your water, the dust of the earth and of the Spirit. And how long the baptismal prayers are where we call down the grace of the Holy Spirit, ask for the grace of Jordan, ask the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the waters, and all these things. Uh, so the, uh, the, this whole picture that's been given to us from the feeding of the multitude on the mountainside, like the Mount of Mount, uh, uh, um, Sinai, on the side of Mount Sinai, and the man being sent to the foolish Siloam to be healed after he's washed in the waters. They're all a great revelation. And here Christ is clearly revealed through these words that he's chosen and through the actions and deeds that have been done that he really is the living God, that he's the Son of God. And uh, this is something that a number of the people were able to understand. And I'm going to get a little technical for a moment, because among the Jews in this whole era, 
perhaps even starting during the period of the Hasmoneans or, or the, the Maccabees. Maccabee wasn't actually a name, it was a movement. But, uh, and, and through this era, there's a bit of a debate going on as the, the formation of rabbinical Judaism is taking place, where the, the, you know, after the destruction of Jerusalem, of course there's no priests and no sacrifices in the temple, so the rabbis are going to take over as the leaders and teachers of the community, as the priests will be sort of dispossessed. Uh, there's a debate going on about certain things in the Old Testament. Now we pointed out some of those when we talked about the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and without Him nothing has been made that was made. Among the Jews, too, they, they realized that so often in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scripture, we're talking about a Word of God that has a personality or personhood of some kind, that acts as an individual, that acts as a person. So how to understand that without falling into some kind of idolatry or pantheism? Uh, there was a debate about it, it was called the second God, no, oh, for want of another title, the second God debate. Who was this word that was doing all of these things? And the Shekinah, which of course we might understand as the Holy Spirit, but somehow there was this Spirit of God doing things. So they took it as three emanations of God, you know, that God projects himself in three different ways. And they had come toward an understanding of the Holy Trinity among, among the Jews. And we see this a lot in what are called the Targums or the commentaries uh, of the rabbis. So they were not totally um, adverse to the idea of a trinity. It was just the definition of the trinity that would have been a problem uh, really for them. So they're, they're starting to grasp and to come to this understanding. And now Christ in the midst of that is revealing himself as the word for the Old Testament. And what we find out ultimately especially through uh, John, in John's Gospel, where he speaks of that Isaiah is, he says directly of Christ, Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. This is when Isaiah saw the Lord of hosts in a vision. And John says that Isaiah spoke, was speaking about Christ as the Lord of hosts. So all of the Old Testament actual appearances of God, what would be called theophanies, or the actually seeing God, were really God the Word in the Old Testament. And so when Christ comes and speaks, if one is, would, would carefully look back at the Hebrew Scripture, and I, I dare say some of the rabbis must have understood this or had some inkling about it, that what Christ was saying is, well, you have this vague notion of the second God, but I'm him. And remember when Apostle Paul went to the Areopagita in, in Greece, and he saw that they had a, a, an altar to the unknown God. Because a lot of Greeks had really, at least the philosophers, come to recognize that there could only be one God. There couldn't be all these other gods. And Apostle Paul said, uh, I, I see that in all things you're very pious. Uh, unfortunately, the King James Version mistranslates that as I see you're very superstitious. That isn't what it says. It says, I see that in all things you're very pious. And he said, the one that you worship ignorantly, I reveal to you. So he begins to reveal about Yahweh, about God, the God of the Jews, and about Christ. And of course, a lot of the Greeks respond to this in a way because they've, they've had come to these conclusions somehow through their own philosophers, through their own study, through their own thinking these things out more, more clearly over the centuries. And uh, the one thing they can't accept, and that really disturbs them, is Paul speaks about the resurrection. And after the time, at least after the time of Plato, maybe before, Plato belonged to a Gnostic movement uh, called the uh, Orphic Gnosticism. Orphic. And uh, they all thought that the body was evil, that the body was an enemy of the spirit and the soul. 
And it was for that reason that the idea of the resurrection disturbed them. Because why would God take on a body if he wanted to reveal himself? His body is evil. Everything flesh, everything material is kind of evil. And this is yet another way that we, we see this huge difference. The Jews had a concept of in the beginning. The Greeks could never have had a concept of in the beginning. And so the, the, uh, a lot of the things that Paul was, was speaking to them were, of course, naturally Jewish ideas he was trying to say in Greek, because the revelation was in Hebrew. And it was very difficult for people to grasp and understand that. And really, in the end, uh, they could say, well, all right, we, we accept this, but it's a mystery. Well, the mystery doesn't always retain being a, a remote mystery. Sometimes it becomes clearer. So when Apostle Paul was telling them, and they see God created the material world, the material existence, so it can't be bad, it can't be the enemy. There has to, we have to have a different vision, a different view, a different understanding. And so the human body is not the enemy of the human soul. They work together. And uh, part of our struggle is getting them to work together in a creative and productive manner rather than in a negative manner. The body cannot do anything that the mind doesn't tell it to do. And uh, the mind can't carry out anything that it wants to do without the body. And the Holy Fathers have repeated this over and over again. So when all that Christ is revealing here, before Abraham was, I am, is saying, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Abraham, first of all. Abraham longed to see my day. And also he says, that he's the God of, uh, of Moses, who spoke to Moses and said, I am. Well, there's something else in here that I think probably is far too often missed. And it's important when Hagar leaves from Sarah and goes off in the wilderness, you know, because Sarah's mistreating her now because she has a son and Sarah doesn't. So uh, Sarah's envious and jealous. So Hagar goes off and she comes to this water spring. and. The, 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 it's there that God speaks to her in some manner and tells her to go back to Sarah. And also promises her that her son is going to have an inheritance of some kind. Not Abraham's inheritance, but another one. But after Abraham dies and is buried with his wife in the, um, the cave, um, Isaac goes up, and where does he go to? In the Hebrew scripture, I mean, it's clearer in the Hebrew scripture. It says, he goes up to the water spring of the living one who sees me. And settled. There he settles. So when Moses hears God on Mount Sinai, saying, ego imi o oh, literally, like I'm the existence itself, I'm the living one. Jehovah, Yahweh. There's something that the Hebrews already know the living one who sees me. There's already a, a, a description of God that they have in their tradition. So this is why Moses could go and say that, because they had the tradition already from the time of Abraham and Isaac, the wellspring of the living one who sees me. And this continues, um, it's in the tradition. So they understand what Moses is saying when he, when he goes into Egypt and speaks to the Hebrews. And where is Moses going to take them? Back to the water spring of the living one who sees me. So they, all of this ties together in a way that they kind of need to grasp it. The wa wa water spring of the living one who sees me, they go to the water spring called the pool of Siloam and wash yourself and you'll see. So in all of these stories, in this gospel, we see how carefully and how neatly it ties together with Old Testament revelation. It's not just the water spring in, in the wilderness where, where Moses strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. Um, but in the tradition from the time of Abraham, from the founding of the holy nation, and the firstborn of the holy nation, Isaac, goes up to dwell by the water spring of the living one who sees me. In the pool of Siloam, which comes out of Hezekiah's tunnel at that spring, 
that brings the water in, life-giving water into Jerusalem. Uh, again, we have this connection with the, the wellspring and someone beginning to see, their eyes being open. And this is all tied together in the revelation from the beginning. So, uh, now, any, any kind of discussion or any questions that one might have? Uh, you know, if you, if you read most of the translations, I, I think people didn't grasp what was being said, the living one, the wellspring, the living one who sees me. So they tried to gloss it some way in the translations, but in the Hebrew, it's, that's clearly what it is. Um, and as we go on through John's Gospel, especially John's Gospel, we see how carefully, because John, you know, and I was a theologian, he has a, he has a, a, a special revelation, a depth of vision, and that's why he was so close to Christ, because he had this depth. He could see more of what Christ was saying, understand it, perhaps better than the others. And that's why he was the beloved disciple, because his mind would grasp the things that Christ was saying, and uh, he really understood them so much better than the others. Perhaps that's why we don't have a Gospel of Peter, but we do have a Gospel of John. So um, we're going to see as we go constantly this tie together with the Revelation, from the Revelation to the Hebrews and how Christ is revealing and unfolding this. Could you <clears throat> say one more time why Jesus asked for the crumbs to be picked, picked up after the, uh, he fed the entire people? Of them? Yeah, because that, when, when the people were, were uh, being fed in the wilderness, they had to go and gather the man of the pill. Yeah. And uh, th this is a type of that. Oh. Otherwise, you might have just left it for the birds because they really deserve to be fed also but specifically to go and gather up the crumbs in it. So that, that, that's very significant. Anybody else have anything? That, uh, I don't like to get too far because some of these things are a little bit, they, they take a little bit of time to soak in and to think about because there's so much of it. Um, you know, it, it, it's clear how the Jews become divided um, how some of them think Christ is the prophet, some of them think he's the Messiah, and others really don't want him to be the Messiah because they want, again, they want a bloody sword. And uh, that, so they misunderstood God himself when they want the bloody sword. They really haven't grasped what people, God's been trying to reveal to them all this time. So. And there are times during this scripture when Jesus works when he goes to people to heal them and other times when when people are asking for his help. So in this particular case, when he goes to the blind men, he goes there purposely to to make a revelation. To make a revelation. Yeah, the blind man hadn't asked anything, whereas right. the son of Timaeus, Mark Timaeus, is calling after him. Right. And uh, so Christ responds. In this case, nothing is asked of him. But what, what is the significant part here is that the Jews who knew all these things were spiritually blind, so he holds their eyes. In other words, seeing, they couldn't see. Right. Because he held their eyes. And he goes out to the man who couldn't see. Seeing, he can see. Not seeing, he can see. And uh, to, to, to make that distinction between the spiritual blindness which makes them un incapable of seeing, and then the possibility of somebody having their spiritual eyes open, so it gives them physical sight, and they gain spiritual sight at the same moment. And uh, it, it's also significant that they say, whose sin that he was born blind, his parents or him? Of course, if he was born blind, when would he have had time to sin? <laughs> and uh, it said, no, no, no. Well, not for anybody's sins. And here's a revelation that the glory of God might be known. And here's what the revelation is. That when your spiritual eyes are open, you see indeed. But when your spiritual eyes are closed, no matter how much you see and what you see, you remain blind. And uh, this, this is what, what Isaiah is getting at, I believe, when he said, you know, hearing you wouldn't hear. 
unless they be converted and, and I should give them life or have life. Uh, it, it's all a mystery and sometimes people don't look at the whole picture and they want to make something of it. So when Isaiah says that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not hear, that he closes their eyes or closes their ears, then some people say, oh, well, he's predestining some people to hear the word and accept it and predestining others to hell. Hell, that isn't what's being said here. This is talking about the difference between spiritual sight and physical sight. That um, the, the man's not, nobody's being punished. The man wasn't born blind to punish anybody. He couldn't inherit his parents' sins. And he hadn't sinned because he was born blind. So it, there had been no, no opportunity for him to sin before he was blind. But uh, we, we find this so often that grasping on a verse or grasping on a proof text verse or a series of them, people come up with teachings that I would genuinely call ungodly teachings. And uh, the reason, uh, because they're completely contrary to what God's actually revealing. You know, you can't have proof text. You can't take verses from here and there that seem to be related because they're not related, they're never related that way. It's like all that we've talked about today, all of these incidents in John's Gospel, are direct reflection through which the revelation taken from the Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, is made known. The veil is taken away, the, the mystery is made known. Now, what was taking place here? What was the mystery unfolding in the, in the Old Testament? And now it's all being unfolded and we can see it. But we start seeing it with the Holy Prophets because if you look and read the, the history, that is Joshua's history and the others, they're so radically different from what the Prophets reveal. But then they're histories, they're not prophecies. And uh, we, we might learn some things from them, but we read them from the fullness of our own hearts. And then the Prophets come along and say, wait a minute. Um, feeding the poor, taking care of the hungry, taking care of the orphans and the widows and the strangers. And this is God's command. There's this hospitality to everyone. And then we remember Pliny's complaint about the Christians and what makes Christians dangerous. A few Romans have written something to the effect. Uh, in, in Roman times, or the, the time of the apostles, there were different guilds. If you belong to the guild of, um, I don't know, masons or builders or something, or the guild of road, uh, road makers or road people who laid the stone for the roads, or the guild of painters, then you, you generally would come take care of your own. If somebody got into difficulty, the guild would, would do something for them. And then what made the Christians dangerous is that they would care for everyone without distinction, not just their own but everyone without distinction. When you came to the Christians and you had medical problems, you were hungry or anything else, they didn't say, are you a Christian? And if you said no, I'm sorry, we can't feed you. They didn't ask anything. They just heard that you were hungry, so they fed you. That was the ancient Christian church. And when people wonder, how did the Christians conquer the Roman Empire for Christ? when they were being burned at the stake and killed and beheaded and tortured and they had no military means, they had no weapons, they had nothing. And even the Roman soldiers who were Christians would lay down their life rather than renounce Christ. You know, Maurice and the uh, Theban Legion, uh, they were all Christians, the entire Legion was Christian. They were very decorated, highly courageous and they served well in the empire. But when the command came that they should offer a sacrifice to the emperor as God, they refused because they were worshippers of Christ. And they decimated the legion first. That means to kill. Decimate means to kill one in ten. So they killed one in ten of the legionaries. Then they were ordered again to offer Caesar, acknowledge Caesar as God. No, we, we can't do that. You know, we'll serve him in the battlefield, we'll fight, we'll defend the empire, we'll defend the emperor, we'll everything that a soldier is supposed to do, but we worship the true and living God, and we acknowledge nothing else as God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. 
and they decimated them again, one in ten. And finally they decided, well, they have to kill Maurice. He was, in spite of the fact that he was a great soldier and highly decorated, highly regarded, nevertheless they killed him and then they exterminated the entire legion. So how did the Christians conquer the Roman Empire? By doing something that almost no Christians do in our era. They conquered the Roman Empire by being Christians. The one thing that Christians seldom ever do in our era, by being Christians, they conquered the Roman Empire. We, like we have the name.